You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, I'm done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? The brother did. The brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you just want to talk about death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just a murdery thingy 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 Relax today. No, we're not. We're high energy. We're we pumped are. up. <laughs> We've got some good stories. Yes. Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy. 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 My name is Mario. My name is Chloe. How's it going? Hey, hey, hey. What's up? I don't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't do that anymore. It's Fat Albert. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> What? You don't remember Fat Albert? No, but I you do. Loved it, but, didn't you? But it was Bill Cosby, <laughs> so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> Ew. Indeed. I actually um, didn't know that. Oh really? Yeah. Sorry to ruin the to ruin Fat Albert for everybody. Or maybe I did know that, but I like. Never mind. We're sure. Like, out of my mind. We'll move on. I have such a good one today. And you're going second, so we'll look forward to that. Try to pay attention during my. I will. Meager oh my god. Mystery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm doing another mobster mystery today. Mm. Um, so I'm going to cover the mystery filled life and uh, very mysterious death of the um, man known as Johnny Roselli. Which I'll, the, the, we'll we'll talk about in just uh, just a moment, but I should just preface by saying that it should come as no surprise that the ever present in our mobster stories, Al Capone, uh, hey. will will make an appearance before too long. So don't worry, but but uh, we'll 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 get there. But we'll start. Al, at, I know our our friend Al, um, so to speak. But we're going to start many, many thousands of miles away from from there, from Al Capone, um, in the small dirt streets of a tiny Italian community called Aspidia in uh, 1905. Oh. And in, in that town, on July 4th, 1905, wow. America's Independence Day, a young boy named Filippo Sacco was born. Yeah. Um, this boy would eventually become one of the most famous mobsters in America and almost completely erase all trace of his humble beginnings in rural Italy. Wow. Uh, from almost anyone knowing about it for most of his life, which is just kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah. At six, though, little Filippo and uh, his mother, uh, Marantonio, joined his father, Vincenzo, in the United States moving to the Boston summer, uh, suburb of Somerville, Massachusetts in, in 1911. And they're part of this huge, huge wave, right, of mostly Southern Italians moving to the United States over many, many, many years because of, you know, deprivation and oppression, et cetera, et cetera. So Filippo's sort of transformation into the cryptic criminal that he would become, um, his sort of breaking bad moment, so to speak... What, what, to use a topical reference from fucking 10 years ago, um, would start with something very sad, actually. The tragic death of his beloved father, Vincenzo Sacco, in uh, 1918, when he was about 12, 13 years old. And according to the sources that I read, Vincenzo was a very loving father um, and husband. He treated, you know, his family and his wife and everything with fairness, with love and care. So it's really sad that actually that he passed away so so early. Um, and it's kind of sad, I think, to think about how things may have turned out differently, right, for um, uh, for Filippo Sacco, Johnny Roselli, you know, if his father hadn't um, succumbed to the to the Spanish flu, which is how he, he died, actually, in the 1918 Spanish flu, which, just side notes, the Spanish flu was one of the deadliest disasters in all of human history that yeah. we know of killing an estimated three to five percent of the earth's population yeah um about bad. 50 to 100 million people infecting up to 500 million worldwide it's fucked up and uh it was yeah within that um you know pandemic that um Filippo's father died and with his father gone and his mother left to tend to him and his uh you know, few siblings that they had had by then, um, Filippo started looking out for himself. He stopped going to school. Um, he figured he was done with that. 
you know, he's, he's passed whatever seventh grade he's, that's enough school. Um, and starts, you know, as so many kids were doing then it would become, you know, orphaned or single parents, uh, just started kind of finding their way on the street, right. Fending for themselves, getting into some petty crimes. Um, and at this time, according to Johnny Roselli, quoted in the Lee Server book, um, that was kind of my main source, um, Massachusetts was the first state to require school attendance, but no one really seemed to mind that Johnny Roselli, you know, just never went back to school, ever. Um, oh, apparently his mom, he found out later that his mom actually found out, and she just, like, didn't tell him or mention it. Just never, just never mentioned it. So she didn't really care. Well, she or? had other siblings, and it again, it wasn't out of the norm necessarily at the time. Like this whole idea of um, uh, being compelled to go to school was still a little bit new. So you know, it wasn't that weird. Uh-huh. Um, and as many young children at the time were trying to do as, as well, because I think this kind of plays into it. He was looking to bring in a little money, right? to his family right? because right. The, the main breadwinner, like his mom hadn't worked b- before. Yeah. Um, it was just his dad who'd been making a pretty good, you know, good salary for them, but you know, now he's gone. Um, so yeah, th- this kind of is what led the beginnings of his life in crime. And eventually Filippo's criminal interest landed in, landed him in some serious quote unquote heat. <laughs> right. <laughs> mob term. It's good. Right. Yeah. Good okay. job. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Including actually setting his stepdad's butcher shop on fire Wait, in te- intentionally what? in an insurance scam. His stepdad came to him and was like, hey, son. And his stepdad didn't treat him great to be to begin with. But um, was like, hey, you know, son, oh, I need you. You need to do this for the family, you know, and I need to get out of these debts. And he put this on this like kid, like 14, 15 year old kid. And he did it. And apparently they got away with it. And uh, wow. got a bunch of money out of it. Yeah. But he had to get out of Dodge, you know, in this case, Dodge being Boston. And uh, this started his, his kind of wanderings for a time. So Johnny, um, as he would come to be known, returned briefly to New York, where, where he had just transited through, right, many years before um, from Ellis Island, and made friends with um, a young Italian drifter, fellow drifter, named Tancredi Tortora. Um, Tancretti Tortara. That's how the, the guy says it in the, in, in the audio book of the Johnny Rosetta. <laughs> Tancredi Tortara. Um, who, sounds musical. I know, right. Uh, well, it's Italian, so of course it sounds musical. <laughs> um, who would, decades later, become the man who would reveal the secret of his real identity of Johnny Roselli's real identity many, wow. many, many years later to the FBI, um, actually. Um, so uh, Johnny, yeah, they, and he, you know, they're bumming around, they're having fun, um, but they're also catching more heat um, in New York, of course, which is New where, York. in New York, which is, <laughs> God, it's terrible, uh, which is where this uh, pseudonym of um, Johnny Roselli came to, to be, where he kind of thought of this. And it was apparently in honor of the Italian Renaissance sculptor Cosimo Roselli, who had um, oh, okay. worked on the Sistine Chapel. So that's where he got... Okay. Apparently he was looking through the encyclopedia, <laughs> trying to find an American, Italian-sounding name, and thought, hey, John Roselli, great. That works. They, exactly. And it did for the, for the remainder of his life. Um, so from this point on, almost no one but his close family and a few very trusted associates in Boston knew that Johnny Roselli was actually Filippo Sacco. And, um, like I said, it would come out, you know, sort of like 40 plus years later, but he, it's crazy that he kept, he kind of kept the secret. Was he still alive when it came out? Um, yes. Oh. And he was confronted with it toward the end of his life. Um, which we'll get to before too long, because like I told you earlier, I'm going to do some kind of like early life, later life, and we're going to cut out like everything in the middle, because there's just like way too much to talk about. Um, so yeah, at the end of the, you know, um, 19 teens and the beginning of the 20s, the roaring 20s, Roselli and Tortora uh, traveled across the country, taking menial and manual labor jobs, getting into trouble, Um, they, you know, would change their names, their occupations, always kind of shifting around, but they focused on some very key areas, uh, making some dough, 
Yep. Getting some girls and having some fun. Fuck bitches, get money. That was their life. They were beginning to be gangsters, living the gangster life oh, in, in a small way. But as so many things do, eventually Tortora and Filippo's, Johnny's friendship came to an end. They parted ways. And Johnny um, stayed in L.A., Los Angeles, where they had eventually gotten to, right? Can't go any further. Mm -hmm. And immediately um, when Johnny got there, he was just, like, enamored of, of the sunshine and the general lawlessness of Los Angeles at the time. Apparently the police were just, like, super corrupt at this point in Los <gasps> oh, Angeles. God. Like, super duper corrupt. Um, <laughs> while Tortura, Tortura fed his wanderlust and moved on, um, never to meet Johnny Roselli again. Meanwhile, the crafty and congenial, very, very nice, amicable Johnny Roselli was endearing himself to some of the most powerful and rich people on the underworld of L.A. And, and even, even some not in the underworld. Um, a trend that would continue throughout his whole life. He always made friends. Everyone always liked him. They always spoke well of him, said he was a gentleman. If they weren't in the mob, they didn't necessarily know he was in the mob. Because he didn't necessarily give off that vibe, which is is weird, but, but it's like something came up like all the time in, in regards huh. to him. And he also eventually earned the nickname Handsome Johnny um, because he was a lifelong bachelor, minus a very brief wedding to a, a movie star uh, for about a year. <laughs> Um, but he had numerous love interests throughout his entire life. And many of right. them were in their 20s <laughs> when he was far away from his 20s. Um, he was also eventually known as the Silver Fox. Um, but I, I doubt he originated that name. I mean, come on. But I don't know. Maybe. Um, Johnny worked his way into being employed and into the good graces of the mafia, um, such as it was in Los Angeles at the time, because apparently it was pretty low stakes there in, in Los Angeles. And in the um, furthermore, in the power politics of the early 1920s, Los Angeles, like within the sort of underworld, right, the sort of white people mob, as you might, you know, say, um, were sort of had the in with the police and they were the big um, sort of big, um, the big cheese. And, I don't know. Anyway, uh, there in Los Angeles at the time, while the smaller outfits like, you know, this offshoot of the Italian mafia were kind of sidelined. And there were like a bunch of other ones, smaller ones, too. Nevertheless, Johnny and his employers um, and compatriots managed to earn a pretty good living um, doing what they called rum running. OK, not necessarily rum. That was kind of like um, anachronistic or whatever, uh, mostly high end um, whiskey. Um, Canadian, Canadian whiskey was coming from Canada, gin, you during know, during the prohibition, I during think. prohibition. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, um, Johnny's first, it was, this was kind of Johnny's first foray into the sort of like covert ops that, um, would, we'll, we'll come back to later, um, in a sort of complex scheme of this illicit booze delivery, right. That involved taking these like really large ships, um, out of ports in Canada, just like thousands and thousands of bottles and lit, yeah. you know, in them. Uh, and of course the liquor was, was legal in Canada, so they could just do this out in the open. Right. And then they would go out to a pre-appointed point out in the ocean, at least 20 miles offshore because it yeah. had to be in international waters and then they would take a bunch of small boats all the way out there and shuttle hundreds or even thousands sometimes of small sacks carrying a few bottles each in, you know in each sack all the way to shore and then coming back and taking more that's, and this would take hours that's booze delivery <laughs> yeah this was like that's serious crazy. sometimes it took all night and they were doing this you know even as dawn was breaking and sometimes the waters were, were bad, you know, and it would be pretty dangerous. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, some people lost their lives doing this. What would you do for liquor? Damn. Not that. Not that. Not that. Um, and this was usually sufficient to, you know, get away with it, right? To not um, attack, uh, uh, attract the attention of the police right, too much. There's, yeah. And again, at the beginning, there really wasn't that much attention to begin with. Um, but as time went on, the heat increased generally in, in, you know, in, in LA. 
So, uh, meanwhile, on a trip to Chicago, um, and this was like maybe the mid to later 20s, um, Johnny met the infamous Al Capone, making his grand entrance. Um, and, uh, of course, at this time he was um, already, or maybe this was right before he became, the head of the, the Chicago outfit. Um, the, the biggest, you know, um, I guess, along with New York, mafia um, organization. And um, they started talking like so many people. Capone was, you know, kind of taken with with Johnny Roselli um, uh, for his, you know, wit and, and charm and whatever he had. Impressed. Right. He was impressed. And um, eventually he asked Johnny to be his intermediary for the Chicago outfit to the Los Angeles wing of the mafia. Um, so he was sort of like Capone's um, messenger. But, but more than that, you know, that sort of messenger implies a low. I mean, he was there to, to give the orders, you know, in, in the voice his, of Al Capone. He was his, his like, his connect. Right, to exactly. That, to that area of the country. Yeah. His he, contact. Ex his contact, exactly. Um, and this was to the man who was running the L.A. wing of the mafia, Jack Drania, um, a man that Johnny already knew quite well and worked for and whom you know, Johnny also liked and uh, liked him. And over the next many years, Johnny Roselli would ingratiate himself with seemingly everyone in Los Angeles, the leaders of the Italian mafia, both in Chicago and L.A., the people who own and ran the major and minor studios in L.A., the even the censors who reviewed the movies for appropriate contact. One of them became one of his best friends for oh, the rest of his damn. life. Um and many of the major film stars who acted in the movies, um, including the Rat Pack. Um, <laughs> he was really good friends with Frank Sinatra, um, actually. Um, and Johnny would also eventually legitimately produce some movies and become, like, in some ways a movie producer, like three of them or something, um, through this small production company called Eagle Lion Studios. Ooh, that's... <laughs> It's kind of a weird name. Yeah. I don't really get it, but anyway. Um, he would also help to extort money from all of the studios, major and minor, through a clandestine takeover of uh, one of the major uh, production unions. Um, and he was involved in many, many other dubious, sneaky, and at the time mysterious, but, but later found out, doings over the decades. Was he ever in Vegas? Oh, Yes. Major, major bet, in Vegas. I bet he... I wonder if he, he brushed shoulders with Bugsy Seagal. Well, it's funny you say that, um, because some people... I don't know, remember if you mentioned this in the episode, think that Jack Drania was the man who put the hit out on Bugsy Seagull, ah. actually. But no, he, he knew Bugsy Seagull. They, they knew each other through the mafia and everything like that. But other than that, I don't know of too many other connections. Bugsy was definitely mentioned in, in the book that, that I listened to. Though. Yeah, because they, they were operating around the same area. Like, he, Bugsy went to, to L.A. for a while, to California, before going to... Right, as so many people did to yeah. get away from the heat. In the East. It's like, it's a thing. Like, it comes up all the time. Yeah. That's actually and then exactly Vegas why. Later. It was literally, literally something, I think his life was in danger. And yeah. so he literally was like, go to Vegas. Uh, his boss was like, go yeah. to Vegas. But it's so funny you say that because actually, um, I wasn't going to talk about it too much, but Johnny Roselli basically was one of the, in, in a way, people who like made Vegas what it was in those early days. Like, yeah. he helped to facilitate, like, opening some of the casinos. He helped... He was uh, actually really um, key in selling a bunch, at least, you know, a few casinos to Howard Hughes, which kind of like changed the nature of, of uh, Vegas, like for all time. No, he is huge in Vegas. Um, but th those are the kind of things that you can really dig into if you listen to this audiobook or read the book, which, mm -hmm. which I would definitely recommend. What's it called? Uh, Handsome Johnny, The Life and Death of Johnny Roselli. And it's by Lee Server. And it, it came out last year in 2018. Um but if I went through, like, uh, even half of the stuff that Lee Server goes through, we'd be here forever. So I'm going to fast forward. And we're going to fast forward to 1960, okay? And uh, picture it. Cuba. Picture it. Picture it. Cuba. We've been watching a lot of uh, Golden Girls lately. Yeah. <laughs> Cuba, 1960. Fidel Castro was one year into his rule, and there are plots galore to do him in. 
And one of these, we found out years later, uh, in the 70s, involved a secret alliance between the CIA and the American Mafia. Classic. Right. So this is 1960. And the point of contact was an ex-FBI agent acting as a so-called cutout for the CIA named Robert Mayhew. A, a cutout is an informal representative for usually an intelligence service. It might be a diplomat might be a, an academic. It's someone who doesn't officially work for the CIA or MI6 or whomever, right? But, but somebody who does research for them or something. Well, or someone who acts who... as a spy for them. Oh. But it's not. It's on the down low. Oh. It's secret. It's like spy shit. It's... <laughs> Like, okay. literally, spy shit. Um, so, yeah, that was Robert Mayhew. And Mayhew was ostensibly retired from the government, but secretly, like I said, not so much. So at, the t at some point, some people at the CIA thought it would be a great idea to get rid of Fidel Castro, right? Um, Hi! <laughs> and for anyone who may be surprised to hear this, first of all, read a book. <laughs> secondly, Mario. I know, right? I'm being such a bitch. Um, secondly, listen to our two-parter on all of the crazy shit that the CIA was getting up to, like especially in its episode, early years. Like episodes 49 and, 49 and 50. 49 and 50. Yeah, 49 and 50. I looked it up. Um, Mayhew approached Johnny Roselli for this very sensitive um, proposition, you know, in 1960. And um, because he knew Johnny, you know, to be both a man deeply involved with the mafia, who they believed could do this, mm. but also a reasonable and reasonably honorable man, which is a fairly rare combination, as you can imagine, right? Yeah. Well, that's uh, what it seemed like when you were talking about how, like, oh, he was so well-liked and this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm, exactly. And yeah. it wasn't really a bias, it seemed. It seemed like he genuinely was well-liked. Right, exactly. People seem to just be taken with him and, and almost forgive him for the, you know, or not look too closely at, at his other side. Um, so, yeah, Johnny um, took the deal. He said he wasn't going to take the money that was offered, which was several hundred thousand dollars at the time. I'll take that. Um, but he said out of patriotic duty, he, oh. he would take the, the job. Okay. And yes, this might it might sound a little contrived or whatever, hokey, but um, it should be noted that Johnny Roselli did also enlist in the army um, during World War Two when he was 36 years old and he was not going to be drafted. Um, oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And despite him that's... having li lifelong he uh, health issues. Um, and he actually that's served for, for a few it. years. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he was uh, given an other than honorable discharge when he was uh, arrested. One of the, the many times he was arrested. What's other than honorable? Other than honorable, it's like not honorable. You know, it's like you didn't do something really bad, I guess. So it's not dishonorable, but it's also not honorable because it's not just like you got out because you wanted to. I don't really know. I'm not too sure. But, um... Yeah, Johnny had gathered a, a a small, you know, after he accepted the the deal, right, the hit. Um, he gathered a small team of trusted mobsters and set about trying to actually engineer the assassination of Fidel Castro. Oh Again, not the only team working on this at the time. Balls. Um, they prepared, they planned, um, they honestly kind of dithered after a while. Uh, eventually, the government supplied them with um, some poison pills. To be secreted to Havana right, and uh, put in Fidel's food, yeah. but um, failed. it failed, and 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 all of their attempts failed. Right. One of them quite disastrously, apparently, according to Johnny, um, to the point that the would-be assassins, the four of them, were found out and tortured by the Castro regime. Possibly, wow. also, there may have been an attempt to turn them um, so that they would you know, c conduct a hit for the, the, the Cubans, um, possibly tying this, of course, inevitably into the killing of, uh, President Kennedy. This goes deep. It goes super deep. Um, and there's, there, there are definitely like conspiracy theories about connections between JFK's murder and Johnny Roselli on both sides. Which is wow. funny, but, you know, it's conspiracy theory. So this and it, yeah, so uh, it went really, really wrong. Um, went really, really wrong. It, it did. It was not, it was not great. Um, so, yeah, this and at least um, one other attempt by the mafia-led 
effort to oust Castro were unsuccessful, and eventually they just abandoned the whole idea. And um, they thought Smart. that it had in, you know, been buried in the secret history of the CIA, but of course that was not to be. <laughs> Because that's the secret history of the CIA. Yeah, well, the secret history of the CIA was made public in 2007, so it's like been officially confirmed that this happened, um, and uh, this w was known as part of um, Operation Mongoose, which was this sort of effort to oust Castro, right? Um, and then it was also detailed in a behind the closed uh, couple of congressional hearings by Johnny Roselli. Um, and this was his testimony um, to uh, the, the uh, church committee, um, it came to be known, which was investigating sort of like all of the out of control intelligence stuff that had been going on like for all time. And this was after Watergate, right? So this was June 24th and September 22nd, 1975. Johnny goes before the Senate. Old. And at this point, he's in his 70s. He's telling what he knows, right? Not not the only time he went before the Senate. Um, he was also brought back before the, uh, the Senate again on April 23rd, 1976, to talk about what he knew about the Kennedy assassination. Johnny had wow, um, he was some idea. Wow, court. Um, well, not court, but, but uh, congressional hearing. Uh -huh. um, Johnny had some idea. He had heard some rumors to the effect that, um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the assassins pointed at Castro may have been turned and redirected back to kill Kennedy. And this may have really been what was going on with the um, Kennedy assassination. Now, I should I should point out, quick to point out, I should be quick to point out, that uh, this was purely hearsay, that there was no evidence for this, and that Johnny himself, while saying this, was telling them this was a rumor that he had heard that he himself was not completely convinced of. And they they brought it up because they knew this was kind of going around, right? Um, but all of that is kind of a mystery for another day, right? Someday maybe we'll do the Kennedy assassination. It's fucking a huge thing, obviously. So ah, it's just so political, and I think it's a lot just of so it's much confusing. So anyway, unbeknownst Anywho. to him and to the senators and whomever, Johnny's untimely demise was fast approaching. At the time, like I said before, he was in his early seventies, and he was honestly trying to retire i mean really he was trying to go straight but okay. really this time like of course he had had these before right but really this time and he was living with his sister and her husband in florida um he he read a lot he watched tv he sat by the pool he didn't do anything shady uh, and he was being watched closely by the fbi at the time um other than meet once in a while with the local head mafioso to pay his respects which he felt like he had to do on July 28th, Johnny took his sister's car for a drive, not telling her where he was going. Now, this in and of itself was not that unusual, and she let him use his car, her car whenever. But when Johnny didn't come back that night or the next day, oh. they were, you know, starting to get pretty worried and contacted the police. They eventually start a search. They find her car parked at the park, uh, parked at the uh, airport parking lot. Um, but essentially no evidence found on it. They thought, well, maybe he's gone on some urgent piece of business that we don't know about. I mean, he's a mysterious guy, right? Um, they didn't, they don't know everything that he's getting up to. However, any suspicion was put to rest tragically when on August 9th of 1976, a 55 gallon steel drum was found floating by some fishermen in, um, the weirdly named Dumbfounding Bay near Miami. Dumbfounding Bay. Very, uh, eerie, I think. So from the smell and, uh, the circumstance, oh. um, they thought this was probably a body. Um, when the police opened the drum, they found that this was correct. Um, the body was highly decomposed. Um, the legs, uh, of Johnny Roselli's body, you know, Filip Filippo Sacco's body, um, had been dismembered and were stuffed next to it in order for the whole body to be put into the drum. 
Um, and this was eventually, like I said, ID'd as Johnny Roselli. So for some time, friends and family had been urging Johnny to get out of Miami, um, to get out of sight, to get, to get out of the danger that they knew was coming for him. But he refused to acknowledge this. He just didn't think that it existed. He didn't think he was in any danger. He thought, well, I'm retired. Who's going to try to kill me? Like, I don't have any enemies. Yikes. Obviously not true. Um, now, it seemed to them that the danger had caught up with him. Now, from where? Some thought maybe it was the CIA cleaning up its mess. Not too plausible for a number of reasons. Or maybe it was a rogue Cuban agent looking for revenge for the attempted assassination of Castro. Again, fairly implausible. Most think that it had something to do with the mafia. Possibly the fact that Johnny Roselli didn't clear his Senate testimony with the mafia higher-ups, and they thought, you know, he may have given info that he shouldn't have, had, uh, shouldn't have, Wait, and so broken the the code of silence, Omerta, so, as the mafia calls so it. So he had to like go to the higher ups and be like, "Hello, am I allowed to retire?" Something like that. Um, more the the testimony before the Senate, because they knew that the Senate was going to ask him about stuff, other mobsters and stuff, right? So what you're supposed to do if you don't want to get killed is to go, you know, to whoever whoever's the local, you know, don, and say, "Hey." You know, I got a subpoena. I have to go before the Senate. But, like, what should I do? And they probably tell him, like, you don't say shit. You say shit, you're dead. And he's like, but I'm going to go to jail. And they're like, yeah, you say shit, you're dead. And then he does whatever he's going to do. <laughs> you know, and that's how it goes. <laughs> like, it gets like, super fucking real. Um, he avoided that. And he thought, well, I'm a smart guy. I'm not going to really tell them anything. And the mafia, they'll know that I'm not really going to tell them anything. But maybe they didn't know. Um, okay, okay. That's right. possible. But we also don't really know what did happen. Right. Because there, there was no... <laughs> trace of a real investigation I could find. Um, no suspects were ever arrested. No one was ever charged. Um, our best shot at, at, at sort of the truth, I think, comes from a contemporaneous New York Times article by Nicholas Gage. Um, this came out like several months after the, the murder had occurred. And um, it, it purports to be what really happened. I don't know whether it is or not, but it's certainly the best story I heard of what really happened. And okay, I'm going to read kind shoot. of an, an extended quote here of, of from this um, article from 1977, I think, by Nicholas Gage, New York Times. The mafia, fi quote, the mafia figure said that shortly after Mr. Roselli's first appearance before the Senate committee on June 24th, 1975, his murder was approved by the Commission of Bosses that sets policy for the 26 mafia families in the country. Several members of the commission had wanted Mr. Roselli killed since the Frontier Hotel case, and when the rest learned that he testified before the Senate committee, they decided he would just go on talking every time he was pressured, and he had to be hit, the mafia figure said. On July 28th, Mr. Roselli and his sister ate a late brunch, and then at 12.50 p.m., he left in her car, a silver 1975 Chevrolet Impala. He gave no hint of having an appointment, and she assumed he would be back soon. What happened then was described by the unnamed mafia figure. Mr. Roselli drove to a marina and went aboard private boat, uh, a private boat where he was received by two men, one an old friend, the other a visitor from Chicago. The boat put off, and a third man on shore drove the Roselli car to the Miami International Airport, where it was later found. While Mr. Roselli was sipping a glass of vodka, the man from Chicago grabbed him from behind and held his hand tightly over Mr. Roselli's nose and mouth until he was asphyxiated. Not a difficult feat, because Mr. Roselli had emphysema. Oh. Within an hour after he got on the boat, he was dead, the mafia figure said. Aboard the boat was an empty metal oil drum, 36 inches high and 22 inches in diameter, with a number of holes cut into it so that it would fill with water and sink. A cannon washcloth was taped tightly over Mr. Roselli's mouth to make sure he was dead. Then his legs were sawed off so uh. that the body could be stuffed into the drum. To lift the body into the oil drum, the men tied a rope around the neck and stuck a tow hook into each side of the abdomen just under the ribs. 
while one man hoisted the body with the rope, the other lifted with the two hooks. When the torso was finally lowered into the drum, the legs were stuffed in with it, and heavy iron chains were laced through the holes in the drum, around the body, and over the lid of the drum. Close quote. Yeah! Quite, quite gruesome. Um, they hooked him. But it, it it speaks, I think. And again, just, just like always, we talk about the gruesome details because they're important to know what happened. And because this it helps you to figure out exactly shit. what happened. It sounds like a mafia hit. I, I, in my completely uninformed opinion. I know, right? <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. Um, more than anything else, right? And this seems like a very plausible story as to what happened. But again, I'm not endorsing any view because we don't know. That's the you know, think about a mystery, which is so great. Um, so Do- Johnny Roselli's death remains very much mysterious, um, as do, you know, um, some other of the stories and, and some others are just fascinating from his life. So uh, again, you know, just encourage, um, pick up, uh, ha- uh, and, you know, read or listen to, uh, Handsome Johnny and, uh, um, by Lee Server. Um, my other sources were Nicholas Gage in the New York Times, Christopher Yogurst at the Washington Post, um, Mafia Wiki, the Johnny Roselli page, uh, Wikipedia, of course, um, Seth Ferranti at Vice. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you say that comes from? The, what, that wow comes thing? from the episode you of... Get, you get close to the mic. The episode of... Um, Harry Potter Puppet Pals. Oh. Wizard Swears. Right, right, exactly. He says the On the el- YouTubes. Elder Swear. Right. And Ron goes, wow. <laughs> it's good. It's good. So now I just say it all the time. Okay, everybody. Get ready for the... <sighs> okay, I have a hell of a story this week, you guys. Um, let's talk about Trevor... Thronberry, not Thornberry. Okay, Thronberry. Thronberry. Yep. Yes, I've heard that name before. Really, Thronberry? Yeah, this is my first time hearing it. So, our story begins in Electra, Texas, nineteen eighty-five. Texas, Mario, Texas. <gasps> oh, Texas. <laughs> um, Trevor Th- Thronberry was sixteen years old when she disappeared. She's described as having brown hair and freckles. She's qui- she was quiet and polite. She was a waitress at the local drive-in hamburger restaurant called The Whistle Stop. Um, she played tennis and she read the Bible. She was normal. She didn't even drink or smoke cigarettes like all the other girls in oh. town. Well, bully for her. Trevor Oh, wait, was... something terrible is going to happen to her, isn't it? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> sorry. Trevor was still a little weird. Quote, One day, at school, she drew a picture of a young girl standing under a leafless tree, her face blue, the sun black. One Sunday, at the Pentecostal church, she stumbled to the front altar, fell to her knees, and began, began telling Jesus that she didn't deserve to live. And then there was that day when Trevor's young niece, Jalisha, who was awake the previous night and whispered that a man was Oops, sorry, no, wait. Young niece, Jalisha, who was staying at the Throneberry home, told people that Treva had shaken her awake the previous night and whispered that a man was outside her room with a gun, which turned out to be not true at all, hmm. end quote. That December of 1985, Treva stopped showing up, at, up to work and school. She seemed to just vanish. So... Electra was a pretty small country town in Texas, right? So the news spread pretty quickly. There was talk that Trevor had been last seen at the police station where she gave a statement claiming that her dad had raped her at gunpoint and her mother had laughed when she found out. A police officer, you know, they heard this, a police officer called Child Welfare. Child Welfare sent a social worker to to Electra to take Treva away, and a judge entered emergency protection orders temporarily preventing uh, Treva's parents, Carl and Patsy Throneberry, from seeing their daughter or even finding out where she was being taken. Uh, Carl and Patsy were described as really normal little town country folk, right? So they had five children, one son and four daughters, Treva being the youngest. Um, 
and you know, they admit uh, they had trouble making ends meet sometimes, but they always made sure that the kids were fed and dressed properly. Uh, in court, Carl and Patsy insisted that Treva wasn't telling the truth. Uh, both older sisters also, or um, the three older sisters also gave affidavits saying that their father was innocent as well. Um, the attorney wanted Trevor, Trevor to even take a lie detector test. Um, Carl accused the members of Electra's Pentecostal church. He was like, if, okay, so if Trevor was raped, it was the, the crazy people over at the Pentecostal church. Turns out Trevor had been going there for comfort and saying that she was scared to be at home. And she said that she had been sneaking out at night to sleep in a pew at the church. Trevor also had odd behaviors at the foster home that she was then taken to. Uh, her foster mother, Sharon Gentry, talked about how gentle and polite Trevor was, but noticed her um, one night curled in the fetal position and like banging her head against the wall. And she was like she was punishing herself or something like that. Um, so she's living in a foster home and she begins t uh, she began attending Wichita Falls High School and. You know, she was a good and thoughtful student. She diligently read her Bible, usually kept to herself. Um, and she started leaving notes in various places for Sharon to find. Really kind of dark ones. Uh, quote, sometimes I wish I were dead. Sometimes I don't. Life seems impossible and death seems eternal. I will have no life after death. End quote. Told, she also told Sharon a story about how back in uh, her hometown of Electra, she had been kidnapped and taken blindfolded to an abandoned oil field where members of a satanic cult tied her to a stake. And then she said that people in black robes were like dancing all around her and that uh, they slit the throats of black cats and dogs and made her drink the blood. Your face is, uh, describe your face to me right now. Dubious. Correct. So she also went to her, opened up to her school counselor, um, told her about how she had suicidal thoughts. In May of 1986, Treva was handcuffed and taken to Wichita Falls State, Falls State Hospital. Uh, she became very depressed, often seen crying. She rarely ate. She was often by herself. They prescribed Xanax for anxiety and Trilophon, which was designed to combat um, what they called thought disorders and an antidepressant by the name of Tofranil. Um, during this time, she wrote a few letters to her, her foster mother, Sharon, as well to a boy that she liked at the time. Doctors described her condition. They put it under like they put it as like a character characterological disorder characterological yeah. disorder yes so i didn't know what characterology was i was like what so basically it's this it's i mean it sounds obvious it's a study of character but usually in regards to how we develop as humans and how our childhood trauma um affects who we are as an adult uh one therapist wrote uh, quote, she's kind of quiet and secretive and she may have a personality problem, end quote. The DA's, meanwhile, the DA's office dismissed the charges against her father, Carl, due to lack of evidence. Um, Treva then met with her parents, but in the presence of a therapist and a social worker. So this is why, this is after um, she had been gone for a while. Uh, the parents told her to admit that she had been lying and Treva completely refused. She called she called her parents liars. She said that they didn't love her and that she had nothing more to say to them. And she just left. Treva was uh, discharged from the state hospital in October of 1986, about five months later. She didn't want to go live with her parents and her parents didn't want her there either unless she were to recant her statement. Um, so she was sent to a troubled adolescent home in Fort Worth called Lena Pope home. So there was, she started working with therapists to improve her behavior. She enrolled in Arlington Heights high school so she could finish her senior year. She graduated in June of 1987. At this point, she also turned 18 and by law couldn't be under state juvenile supervision. 
So she started making plans to begin her own. She said that she wanted to apply to a, bi a Bible college that uh, didn't require an SAT score. And she said she just wanted to feel normal and live a full life. Uh, she did go back to Electra for about a day, only to visit her sisters, her three sisters, Carlene, Kim, and Sue. Um, this is where things get dark. So they they really wanted her to come back home, back to Electra, but they also understood why she couldn't. Um, all four girls had been sexually assaulted by their uncle, Billy Ray. Carl, uh, Billy Ray is Carl's older brother, who he, they're like best friends. He adores his older brother, right? And so Billy Ray actually visited quite often. Um, he would take them for a ride in his car to the store and if they protested, uh, their dad would say that, hey, you're being impolite, like, um, and that they should, quote, let Uncle Billy buy them something nice, end quote. Jesus. Yeah, he would, like, give them gifts and shit. Um, Carlene, Kim, and Sue gave formal statements long after their uncle had died, talked, and they talked about how he would sneak into their rooms at night. Quote, we had tried to let Mama and Daddy know what he was doing. At least we thought we had. But we didn't come out and say anything outright because Billy Ray had told us that if we ever did, he'd have Mama and Daddy killed. And then we'd have, and then he'd have us all to himself. What were we supposed to do? We thought, and I know this sounds terrible, that this was the way things worked and that this was how everyone lived, end quote. Mm. So this was like small town mid-80s, yeah. right? So people didn't talk about these things. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the... You know, not that it only happens in small towns, but I feel like being separated from today. other people. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, in any time, you know, it's like it makes it easier if you're in any kind of cloistered environment. Yeah. You know, Um. so the girls, they did everything they could to stay away from home and stay away from their uncle. They like worked double shifts at their jobs. They stayed after school. Um, they even got married young and moved out pretty quickly. And Trevor was left alone, and so she became mm. Billy's favorite. Um, so Tre Trevor only spent a day visiting Electra, and after that, she was rarely heard from. She never did go to college. She lived briefly in the Fort Worth area with a woman who was raising three children, and supposedly she went to go live at a YWCA her foster mother, Sharon Gentry, received a collect phone call from Treva once, uh, and Treva told her that she was working at a rundown motel in Arlington. Uh, she called again sometime later and said she was living on the streets, and then she disappeared. Years passed, and no one heard from Treva Throneberry. Many assumed that she had been killed. Vancouver, Washington, 1997. 16-year-old... Brianna Stewart, was the new girl at Evergreen High School. She had been living in Portland, Oregon, just across the Columbia River from Vancouver for almost a year. Um, she was walking the streets during the day and sleeping in grim youth shelters at night. She attended services at Glad Tidings Church, where she met a young couple who took her in. The couple believed that Brianna was full of potential and determined to succeed, so they went. They enrolled her in the 10th grade at Evergreen, Evergreen High School. Greg Merrill, the school counselor, asked Brianna about her past, and she said she had been raised outside Mobile, Alabama by her mother and Navajo stepfather, who was also a sheriff's deputy. She also told the counselor that her mother had been murdered when she was a child, and, lived, and so she lived with her stepfather. She ran away when she was 13, hitchhiked to the Northwest because her mother told her that her real father lived somewhere in the Northwest. And so that's why she was there. She wanted to find clues about her past. Brianna Stewart, uh, so she, yep, she was enrolled uh, at Evergreen High School. She became a bright student who loved school, usually came to school in a t-shirt, overalls, and pigtails. Uh, she carried with her a tennis racket and a Bible that she loved to read. She was a classic teenage wallflower. One day, she met Ken Dunn in Algebra 1 class. He, talked to, he started to talk to his friends about how much he liked her, and he was impressed at how smart she was, and he liked her southern accent and how she knew so much about the Bible. And so he starts escorting her to class, and then they start exchanging flirtatious notes in Algebra class. And so then he starts taking Brianna on little dates in his 1978 brown El Camino, his friends called 
the turd tank. <laughs> That's great. I know. Um, so Brianna didn't usually talk about her past, but eventually she opened up to Ken. She told him about how she watched her father stab her mother to death and carry the body away. He then, she said that he then made tapes of himself and his friends raping her, which he sold on the black market. Uh, she became pregnant at the age of 11, 11 or 12. And Travis said her stepfather pushed her down a flight of stairs to force her to miscarry. When she went to the police, no one believed her. And she fled before being st uh, sent back home to her stepfather. She also talked about how earlier that summer she had gotten to know a security guard who worked in Van who worked in downtown Vancouver. She uh, tells Ken about how the two of them were sitting in his car one day when he forced her to pull down her pants and he ended up raping her. Quote from Ken, quote, here was this beautiful girl who had been forced to endure unimaginable atrocities. And yet here she is. Here she was at Evergreen, wanting to make something of herself in life. I wanted to help. I wanted to make her happy. I wanted her to know that someone cared for her. End quote. Later, he took her as his date to the Sadie Hawkins dance where they wore matching blue overalls and <laughs> shared their first kiss. Uh, Brianna Stewart became more well known by the fall of 98, uh, her junior year. She ended up going to the police and reporting the security guard who raped her. He pled guilty um, to, quote, communicating with a minor for immoral purposes, end quote. At this point, Brianna starts to focus on her future and having a normal life. She wants to become a lawyer, focusing on children's issues. She expresses how she wants to find out more about her past. And uh, she also wanted a social security number so she could get a driver's license, apply for a job, and go to school. The issue was that the federal government wouldn't give her a new social security number unless she located her birth certificate and evidence of her real father. The mental health professionals that she went to see believed that she had some sort of amnesia and or suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. She was also interviewed by a Portland newspaper in 1999. She said, quote, I may I may now know who I was. Sorry, I may not know who I was before I was three, but I do know who I am now. End quote. So there was a lot of people on her side willing to help her out, willing to help her, like, discover her identity. Right. So. A state social worker searched through governmental records to find any evidence of Brianna, her mother, or the man she said was her stepfather. Um, a worker from Indian Health Services looked through national databases of missing children. Um, he even asked her to give blood in hopes of finding a DNA match. There was never any luck. Brianna even took time off school in January of 2000 to visit where she said she had been raised, Daphne, Alabama. A police detective from Daphne spent several days like driving her around hoping she would see something that would jog her memory um but no one ever found any evidence that she even lived there one possible clue came when she visited a dentist in portland the dentist noted to a social worker that he was surprised that brianna's wisdom teeth had been taken out and that the scars had been healed which was weird for a 16 year old girl um brianna Okay, so she reacted really strongly when the social work worker asked her about, like, the dentist statement. Mm -hmm. So she responded with a five-page paper, uh, with a, a fi yeah, five-page letter criticizing those who doubted her story. Quote, my word means much to me, and when I give my word that I am doing and being as honest and upfront as I can with the information about myself, I mean it. End quote. Okay. Brianna talked to Ken about the dentist story, too, and she became angry when he said that maybe the dentist was on to something. You know, maybe he maybe there's some water there. She accused him of being the liar and thinking of being a liar and thinking she's not 16. She was like, how could you say you love me? By the end of their junior year. Uh, Brianna was staying with the Gambetta family. So she's still, you know, a foster kid, right? She's still trying to find her identity. She's still living, you know, going from house to house. Um, whose son was good friends with Ken. Um, the church family that ha she had been living with before could no longer afford to keep her. Mm -hmm. So the Gambettas had been treating her like a daughter. They gave her the spare bedroom. They provided her with an allowance of $10 a week. Everything seemed perfect until 
May of 1999, when Brianna called the police and said that David Gambetta, the father of the household, had been spying on her. And she said that he had put uh, miniature cameras on her, like, lamp and in her room, and he was making videotapes of her as she undressed. Police did a quick investigation and decided that the accusations were groundless and the Gambettas were like, get out. Um, Brianna found a new home with the mother of a police officer, but continued to insist that she was telling the truth. At that point, even her boyfriend, Ken, doubted that she was, doubted everything she was saying, and he started to second-guess the other stories that she had told him as well. Uh, Brianna Stewart ended up graduating from Evergreen High School in June of 2000. She was planning to go uh, to a community college in Vancouver, and the school uh, over there was allowing her to go with a tuition scholarship, even though she didn't have a social security number. Her boyfriend, Ken, was leaving Vancouver to work at Disney World. He still loved her, but he wished her luck and left. So Brianna spent the summer of 2000 working as a volunteer answering phones for the Ralph Nader presidential campaign. And most of her time was um, devoted to... During this time, it's her goal to get a social security number, right? She just wants to go to school and live a life. She she writes a letter to the governor of Washington asking for help. And then she does some sneaky shit and hires two separate lawyers, one in Vancouver and one in Portland. And the two didn't even know about each other or what they what the other one was doing. The attorney in Vancouver sued the state uh, to force the vital records office to issue Brianna's birth certificate. And that attorney provided proof like school transcripts and medical records. The other attorney in in Portland chose to petition the federal government directly asking it to issue Brianna's social security number. Note, Brianna agreed to submit a fingerprint test to make sure there was no chance she could be someone else. Mm -hmm. Brianna Stewart's wish was granted in 2001 when the attorney general allowed her to petition for a new birth certificate. All she had to do was appear at a trial in March. This is when things started going to shit. Hmm. One week before she was officially wish before she was to officially become Brianna Stewart. She was arrested on March 22nd, 2001 on charges of theft and perjury. Why, you may ask? Because Brianna Stewart wasn't who she said she was at all. And that's where we'll pick up <gasps> and the what? next episode. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. No, that's that's good. So it's a big big turn coming. Okay, it gets better. Okay, it gets so much better. Okay, well, we'll uh, have to wait till next week, I guess. We'll do it a little earlier next week. Um, well, thanks for listening, you guys. Um, you do you have weird shit in the news? Oh, <gasps> I do have weird shit in the news. Good for you. So, I don't have any. <laughs> I was going to talk think. about how. Um, Oh. There are tardigrades on the moon now. Right. Well, that's the there's yeah some r- rumblings well, that may be what's going on. Well, that they are like dehydrated and like right. They haven't found them or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Tardigrades slash water bears. You guys should right. look into that shit. It's quite interesting. Or just right. watch the Family Guy episode. They're great. Where Stewie and Brian shrink themselves to the side of size of water bears. Right. Anyway. Um, anyway. Um. So. What I ended up choosing was um, from Nashville, a story from Nashville, um, a story posted by Alexandra Keene. It's about uh, a police chase <laughs> that spanned multiple states, um, and it was a police chase of a kitten-filled car, <laughs> and the suspect was arrested. So, Clarksville, Tennessee. Okay, so this kid is 19. His name is James A. Pitt. And his fucking... His mugshot. mugshot. <laughs> he's, like, smiling. He doesn't look 19. He looks like he's maybe 15 or 16. See. Right? Oh, yeah. He, he looks, looks like he's, like, 16. He looks yeah. really young. Um, so, he stole a white BMW at a rest area um, off the interstate in Lee Summit, Missouri. Um... I guess he had a girl with him before, but she was dropped off somewhere in Missouri or Illinois. Uh, Illinois. I can't believe I just said <laughs> Illinois. Uh, Pitts later led uh, Illinois Illinois State Police on a chase in the southern region of the state near I-57 and I-24 interchange. 
um, he got away and then he crossed the uh, border. And so the Illinois police notified Kentucky State Police that that's where he was headed. So Sunday, uh, 1115 a.m. So this was last week. Um, the Kentucky State Police spot the BMW and they try to pull him over. Um, but he keeps driving and then he crosses, uh, the state line again over to Montgomery County, Tennessee. And he eventually crashes the car in Clarksville. Um, yeah, it's wild that it could happen. Yeah. Quote. Yeah. Oh my God. Crazy. Yeah. And the kittens and cats that were in the stolen BMW are okay. Okay. They are the, they are in the care of Montgomery County Animal Care and Control. Fortunately, the owner of the stolen car has already called them and plans on picking the cats up soon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> scared, <laughs> probably so confused. I'm so scared for the cats. Um, oh, so I, I I I found something. It's not well. It is. I guess it's pretty weird. Okay, I'm so, excited. Okay, I don't. Have you heard about this guy? Okay, this French guy, and he's made this like, but actually flying machine. No. Where you can he can like hover like fucking like 50 feet in the air no and stay, no but seriously like it, i'm not joking like when's it's it gonna real. be commercialized uh well i think it's probably super expensive and finicky but it really works and recently he successfully on the second try crossed the english channel <gasps> and became yeah the first to cross the english channel on a fucking hoverboard whatever bullshit um and his name is frankie zapata and uh, he did it in just over 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, this thing can go like 80 miles an hour, too. What? Uh, yeah, so pretty cool and pretty weird. Send me pics. Uh, pics or it didn't happen. Thanks for listening, you guys. Oh, I forgot to do my source. Oh, your It's super important because I said it was a very long, really, really dramatic and well-written article um, from Texas Monthly. Oh, right, that long-form text. By Texas Mimi Swartz. And then um, my other one is a story from the Olympian, um, but this story won't come in till part two. Okay, <laughs> cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, cool great. No well, check out our Twitter. Check out the Twitter, Insta. the Facebook, the Instagram. All that stuff. It's Have... late. Thank you guys so much for being patient with us. We love you. Uh, bye. Happy Wednesday. Yeah, bye. bye.